All right. Daniel chapter nine. This is Daniel's prayer. It starts out as, as Daniel's prayer. If you recall, he was, this is, it's been a couple of weeks now, so I'll give you some background here. This was at the end, we're nearing the end of the Babylonian captivity. This is the first year of Darius or Darius. It's right after Babylon was overthrown. So Daniel's reading through the books, reading through the scriptures, and specifically through Jeremiah, Jeremiah's prophecy, and he's seeing that 70 years have been decreed uh, for his for his people, for, for Judah, for Israel, for the city. And he's he's knowing that the time is is winding down now. The captivity is almost over. So he's he's praying to the Lord just like Leviticus 26 told him uh, Leviticus 25 and 26 specifically talks about that, that Sabbath rest that the land was supposed to have and what's going to happen if they don't give the land, the Sabbath rest that it's going to, that the Lord's going to, uh, going to take them into captivity. And, and they did that for 70 times, seven years. So that's why there's 70 years of captivity. And then, but then in chapter 26, Leviticus 26, the Lord tells them, this is what you're to do once you're in that captivity. If you're you're to uh, repent, confess your sins, like just like Daniel's doing. Um, did, did we look at that? I, I think we did, but wouldn't hurt to look at it again. So Leviticus 26, just to see how that matches up with, with Daniel's prayer in, in Daniel 9. Leviticus 26 says... Um, he said, I'm going to verse Leviticus 26, verse 32 he says, I'm, I'm going to make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall be appalled over it. You, I'll scatter you among the nations. I'll draw out a sword after you. Your land becomes desolate. Your cities become waste. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you're in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest, which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living in it. They okay, now jump down to verse 40, a couple of verses later. It says, if you if they confess, well, maybe I start at 39. Um, let's see. So those of you may be left will not rot away because of their iniquity in the lands of their enemies. Also, because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will they will rot away with them. Now, verse 40, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me, I was also acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies. Or if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they then make amends for their iniquity or so that they accept the punishment for their iniquity, depending on your translation, then I will remember will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham as well. I remember, I will remember the land. Okay, so he's Leviticus, the Lord's town, confess your iniquities and the iniquities of your forefathers of your unfaithfulness against me. And that's basically what Daniel's doing here in chapter nine. He's he's confessing, and, and that Daniel even says he said, I'm confessing my sins as well as the sins of the nation. And our fathers that we have not listened to you. And what do you remember what specifically Daniel was asking for there? He um well his whole prayer, it's a long prayer. It's starting in like verse three, three or four, down to about verse, oh, I don't know, 19. And basically what he's doing, he's he's confessing the the unfaithfulness, the wickedness of of, of Judah, of Israel. Contrasting that with God's faithfulness, God's righteousness, God's compassion. That's basically what his prayer is. He goes back and forth between praising God for his righteousness and faithfulness and confessing the unfaithfulness of Israel and, and Judah. And it's and it's not when he's confessing this, he's not saying, you know, all oh, we, you know, we accidentally slipped into, you know, committed a sin. He's he's talking about deliberate transgression. They they deliberately rejected the Lord. It wasn't you know like you or I you know oh, I you know I lost my temper today. No, it was they deliberately rejected the Lord. That's what the transgression is. That that was their, and we'll see. That's gonna when we get down to the last few verses of this chapter, we'll see why that's important. And uh, so 
what the the gist his final request i guess what you say after he's proclaiming israel's failures and and god's righteousness we get down to the the last verse there um let's see down to verse 17 through 19 or 16 through 19 is the is the gist of what he's asking for in this prayer he's saying verse 16 it says, now, according to your righteousness, let your anger and wrath be turned away from the city. So that's what he's asking for. He said, turn, turn away your anger and wrath. And what's interesting is um, Gabriel, when he gives the answer to the prayer, he's going to tell him how that anger and wrath is going to be turned away. It's going to be turned away by the Messiah. So he says, he's saying, turn away your anger and your wrath. Um, let's see. And he, and he says, forgive. He says, Open your eyes, hear our call, forgive us, forgive us. And then he says, let your, where is it? Um, let your face, verse 17, let your face shine on the desolate sanctuary. Okay, so he's he's calling upon God to, uh, we lost him. He's calling upon God. He says, I'm not doing this because we're righteous, because we're not. We're doing it because of your great compassion. So he's. Basically saying, forgive us, turn your wrath away from us, and let your face shine upon this sanctuary. We restore, forgive us, and restore the city and, and, the, and the temple is basically what he's, it's the gist of his prayer. And so we're going to see that when Gabriel comes and answers and gives God's answer, it's going to be even greater than what Daniel's asking for. And I think there's a couple of lessons here. First of all, we see Gabriel in verse 20. Daniel didn't, didn't even finish his prayer. He says, wow, I was still speaking and praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people, presenting my supplication. While I was still speaking in prayer, me and Gabriel came to me. So I, I thought that's interesting that he didn't even finish his prayer and God's already coming to answer. Now, we're going to see a contrast to that in chapter 10. In ch chapter 10, <clears throat> Daniel's praying for three weeks until the answer comes. And we're going to see the angel is going to say to him, I, I, he said, I tried to come to you right away, but the prince of Persia opposed me. So that, that's another, uh, I guess, something else we can apply to our prayers. You know, it's when there's delays in the answer to our prayers, it's, it's not necessarily that... Uh, you know, God is saying no. There's could be a you know a spiritual battle going on between the the angels that He's sending to answer the prayers and the the evil forces. Go ahead, Tom. Is the Prince of Persia is he an angel? Is that an angel? I'm um, yeah. That's that's a good question. I'm thinking it's a demon, but I, I oh. for sure because in Dan in Daniel chapter ten when when this is happening, he's giving another. Uh, vision of of Persia and Greece, and and he mentions the Prince of Persia, and he mentions the Prince of Peace. I mean, Prince of Greece. So, is that a a demon that's assigned to those nations, or is that speaking about like the king or the you know one of the the government? I don't I don't know. I I can't say for certain. But mm -hmm. since since it's an angelic being that that's being hindered by by that prince of Persia, I'm guessing it must must be a, a demon, but I don't know. But but Jacob wrestled with an angel, and That's true. that was a human angel angelic thing. Good point. So yeah, so maybe it is was a human being. Yeah, just curious. Yeah, good good question. Good point about Jacob. So yeah, I don't know if anybody else has any insight or not. I I, I know there's I know there's different there's not i don't think there's a consensus you know if you look at any of the other uh scholars some of them will say it's a, an angelic being some will say it was uh you know the king of persia but, yeah. i was just curious so uh, yeah no, yeah but that is interesting because you know you think of how that how does that apply to us um i right. guess yeah right. you, you'd think uh you know, a human being wouldn't be any match for uh, an angelic being, but then you bring that point up about Jacob wrestling with the angel. So I don't know. 
Yeah. Kind of curious. So anyway, yeah, we can we can look at that more when we get to chapter 10. But but in chapter nine now, uh, it's interesting that Dean doesn't even finish his prayer and Gabriel's already there uh answering. So then yeah, that brings up another question. You know, where where are these angelic beings? You know, we think of them being in you know in the third heaven with God, but but you know, where is that third heaven? Is it you know, is it like way out beyond outer space, or is it you know, it's just another dimension? Because they, as far as I can tell, they may be right here amongst us right now. We just can't see them because it's a different. Right. Dimension. We see, you know, you see uh, in scripture how that happened, where all of a sudden, you know, the angelic beings are there. Some see them and some don't, and and you even see that you hear testimonies of that today about angelic beings that people see. So I don't know. I I kind of lean towards being uh, just another dimension that we can't see, but, but I don't know. I can't say with one hundred percent certainty. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so so Gabriel, he's there, and well, that, that's another, uh, I guess, another personal application. You know, G Gabriel interrupts Daniel while he's praying. You know, do we ever stop and allow? You know, when we're in the middle of praying, stop to to listen to God, or are we just too busy? You know, flapping our gums that we don't we don't hear from the Lord. <laughs> Um, I don't know, but anyway, I, th I think that's something we need to keep in mind when, when we're praying that, you know, we need to, it's not just a one-way conversation. We want to listen to what the Lord has to say too. He's probably heard so many prayers from Daniel that he's like, this guy, is, he, he can go forever. He, he knows how <laughs> bad it is down there. He can go forever. I got to cut him off so I can get something done. <laughs> Uh, it could be. That'd be a good problem to have. Yeah, right. Yeah, if only, if only we were like that, huh? Yeah. Go ahead, Sandra. You have something to share? Yeah, it reminds me of one time, like you know, like I was actually praying, like I daily do, you know, like for the nation and everything, and of course, family and all that. And the and at that moment, I was focusing on the nation, and I was praying for the nation in detail. But uh, in the middle of that, all of a sudden, I saw um, like a vision or picture of um, one of my co-workers. And it was actually a word of knowledge related, you know, to one of my co-workers, which was sort of like, I mean, I felt like, like, you know, this, I'm, my thoughts and my prayers are for the nation. It has nothing to do with my, you know, co-worker or anything mm -hmm. like that. Like, it's not like I'm praying for um the company and my workplace and and then this shows up it makes sense you know but it was sort of like interjected like when I was praying for something entirely different um so yeah I mean like it reminded me of the same you know thing like how Daniel was praying and then all of a sudden uh he was interjected by God for something else yeah yeah great great uh yeah thanks for sharing that Sandra but yeah, that's that's basically what's happening here with Daniel, because yeah, God, what what God tells Daniel isn't isn't exactly. I mean, it's it's related to what he's praying for, but it's but not exactly. So yeah, thanks for sharing that, Sandra. Mark, do you have something to share? Yeah, uh, we're covering in another uh, Bible study. Uh, we're covering um, uh, Whisper, uh, which is uh, the um, the. Uh, you know, the techniques or the way that you can, you know, practice to hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. And um, the the first session talked about the uh, prayer of Eli, the uh, uh, speak, God, your servant mm -hmm. is listening, you mm -hmm. know, and to the, then to just shut up, you know, mm -hmm. uh, so you can hear. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, something that came to mind when we when you uh, when we were talking about uh how we how we pray and don't let god get a word in yeah right. think, thanks yeah, sometimes i think a lot of our prayers should be listening more than talking mm -hmm. you know instead of asking and telling them oh i got this i need a gallon of milk and i mm -hmm. need this and that and, uh, you know just you know, why don't you sit and listen to what i gotta tell you <laughs> okay okay good idea yeah <laughs> yeah yeah all right uh, all right. So in, in verse 21, 
it's what well, it can be translated two different ways where he says he, he came to me. I'm not sure what your translation says, but it says he came to me in my extreme weariness. And some translations say that he, he flew swiftly. That, that, that word there, can, it's, uh, I think the literal translation is wearisome weariness or something like that. So it could be referring to either uh, wearisome flight that Gabriel was weary from the flight, or it could be referring to Daniel that Daniel was extremely weary, wearisome. And we talked about that a little bit last time. And I think either one could apply, but I we know how weary Daniel was after his the vision in chapter eight. Do you remember that he was like worn out? He just like fell on his face. He was didn't understand it. So I, I'm I'm leaning towards that. Um, that Daniel it came in Daniel's extreme weariness, but I don't know if anybody has any additional insight on that. I don't even know for sure. We don't even know for sure if angels fly, although we do know the cherubim, they were, they were a type of angel. Remember in Isaiah, the, the cherubim with, with six wings, you know, two, he, what did it say? Two, he covered his face, two, he covered his feet, and two, he flew with. So we, knew, we know that some angels, at least cherubim, do fly. So I don't know, but I'll just leave it at that unless somebody has additional insight. I, I imagine it's just got to be overwhelming to be in the presence of God. I mean, it's got to be a draining, draining thing, no matter what he tells you or anything. Just to be yeah. in your presence. Yeah. I, I think, Dan, yeah, we, we already know from chapter eight that Daniel was weary. He was extremely weary, you know, overwhelmed. Yeah. I mean, I say, uh, I am undone or something. Yeah. I mean, yeah. all kinds of examples. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just I think it's just about every time an angel appears to someone, the first thing they say is fear not because you're just so overwhelmed being in, in presence of an angelic being. Imagine how much more so when we're face to face with the Lord, what that's going to yeah. be. Like. Yes. Yeah. Then, was it John that said, I felt on my face as though I was dead whenever he is so. Yeah. Anyway, I, yeah, I think I have to agree with you. I think it's Daniel that was extremely weary. He was just overcome. And another, something else in that, there's a lot in just in that one little verse there. Um, what time, verse 21, what time did Gabriel appear to Daniel? In verse, according to Daniel 9, verse 21. His very last part of that, of verse 21. He came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of what? In your 921. Evening sacrifice. The evening sacrifice. Why, why do you think that's significant? Why, why would God include that in this scripture? First of all, what, when would that... What sacrifices would have been going on at this point? Remember the temple had sacrifices. Exactly. Remember the temple had been destroyed in 586, like 50 years prior to this. So there wouldn't have even been any sacrifices going on at this time, would there? Since the temple was destroyed. But yet a couple a couple of points. A couple of things come to mind there. First of all, Daniel records that at the time of the evening sacrifice. There hasn't been a sacrifice going on for 50, 50 years and even longer for Daniel because Daniel has been in captivity for like 68 years now. But yet he's still keeping time by the evening sacrifice. I think that, for one thing, I think that's a testimony to his faithfulness to his God that he's still mindful of the of the evening sacrifices, even though he hasn't seen one for 60 some years. Something else that I think is, is significant. And we're going to see it when we get down to verse 24 to through 27. Do you, do you remember that? Okay. There was two, there's two sacrifices required each day. There was a, a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. Okay. Um, we'll take a look. Let's go to, Let's go to Exodus 29, where you can see where that is. It's in Exodus, and it's also in Numbers. Exodus 
Exodus 29, 38 through 43. Yeah, Exodus 29, 38, this is what you shall offer on the altar, two one-year-old lambs each day continuously. One lamb offer in the morning, the other offer at twilight. Okay. And then, yeah, verse 41, the other lamb offer at twilight. Offer it with the same grain offering. It, verse 42, it shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the doorway of the tent of your meeting. And I will meet with you and speak to you there. I will meet with there with the sons of Israel. It shall be consecrated by my glory. Okay. And Numbers 28, I think it's basically says the same thing. We don't need to go there, but I'm curious just to double check. I don't think there's anything additional there. Neat. Three through eight. Um uh, an offering by fire, two male lambs, one year old. With, okay, here's another one. Without defect. Okay, so that to be without defect. A continual burn offering every day. One lamb in the morning, the other lamb at twilight, etc. Okay, so it has to be an unblemished lamb without defect. And so Gabriel's coming at the last, at the time of the evening sacrifice, the last sacrifice of the day. Do you remember what time? And that would be, that's uh, generally about about three o'clock in the afternoon is when that that last sacrifice was. Do you remember when Jesus was sacrificed? Okay. Anybody remember what time of day Jesus was sacrificed? It's in it's in all I think it's in at least three of the gospels. Jesus was sacrificed. He he died at well, he was on the cross for what was it? How many hours? But he actually, when he when he committed his spirit into the Father's hands, it was at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is the time of the evening sacrifice. So Gabriel is coming, and it's going to be significant when we see what the answer to Gabriel's uh, Daniel's prayer is that he gives in verses twenty four through twenty seven. But so Gabriel's coming at the time of the final sacrifice of the day. Christ came as the final sacrifice of all time, sacrifice at the same time of the day, about the same time of day that Gabriel comes. And that's not a coincidence. Um, Matthew 20, Matthew 27, 46, I think is where it is. 27, 56. Uh, let's see. That's not it. 46. I'm sorry. 46. Um, at about the ninth hour, which would be about three in the afternoon, because it starts at, um, let's see, 45. This, the clock starts, I think, at 6 a.m. So about the ninth hour, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness fell upon the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then verse 50, he cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And that's when the veil of the temple was torn in two. The Holy of Holies was opened up to allow all to enter into the presence of God. So... All right, so Gabriel's coming now to Daniel at the time of the evening sacrifice, the final sacrifice of the day. Christ came as the final sacrifice of all time at the same time of day. And let's see. All right, so question 22, what did what did Daniel or what did Gabriel what was the reason Gabriel comes to to respond to Daniel's prayer. In verse 20, let's see. Well, verse 21, while I was still speaking, Gabriel came during the time of the evening offering. And here's what Gabriel, Gabriel said. He, it's interesting. Gabriel did not say, I came to answer your prayer. Look what he says. Verse 22, Gabriel comes. He gave me instruction. He talked with me and he said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. Okay. So he's come to give him insight and understanding. You'd think he would say, okay, Daniel, I came, I'm, I'm answering your prayer now. 
I'm going to, the sins of Israel and Judah, the sins of your people are forgiven. I'm going to restore your, your land, your, your temple. That's not exactly what he's, what he's saying here. He is, he is going to allude to that by saying, I'm, I'm coming forth to give you insight with understanding. And verse 23 He's going to say, at the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. That was back at uh, verse 3 of this chapter. So as soon as you started to, to give your supplications, as soon as you started to pray, command was issued. God, God gave me a command to come. I've come to tell you. And here's what why he has come to tell you. Look at verse 23. You are highly esteemed. Or it could be you're, you're greatly loved. You're you're valuable, you're desirable, you're pleasant, precious, you're highly esteemed. And is, I don't know, I find that to be very interesting and, and encouraging because, you know, what's, what's true of Daniel should be true of each one of us if we're in Christ. God's going to come and, and answer our prayers because we're highly esteemed, we're, we're precious, we're valuable. And we think of the price Jesus paid for us, God obviously places a great value on us. He paid a great price. So he's come to Daniel saying, you're very precious. You're highly esteemed. You're valuable. You're greatly beloved. That's why I've come. That's why the commandment has been given. Remember John in John's gospel, he, he refers to himself as a disciple that Jesus loved. And, and I think each one of us could, could make that same claim. We're the disciple that Jesus loved. So that's why he's coming, because you're greatly loved. So he says, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. So what message and vision is he talking about here? Did you see any message and vision mentioned in chapter 9? It, so far, it's just been Daniel's prayer. So he says, give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. It could be that he's talking about what he's going to say here in these next four verses, although it's not exactly a vision, is it? It, it could be, it sounds like a message, but I don't know that I would call verse 24 through 27 a vision. Um, so I'm wondering, is he referring to the vision that Daniel saw back in chapter 8? I don't know, maybe one of you... It's given some has been given some insight on that. If you recall the vision, remember the vision in, in chapter eight is where Gabriel came to Daniel, told him about this vision of the, the ram and the and the goat. And Daniel, even after Gabriel came, gave him the interpretation of the of the vision, he still didn't understand it. Remember, he said there said I was exhausted, I was sick for days, I was astounded at the vision, but there was none to explain it, even though Gabriel gave him the interpretation. So I don't know if that's if that's what Gabriel's talking about here in chapter 9 or not. It, it very well could be because he was sent to give him understanding of the vision, which he didn't have understanding before. I don't know. Now, what's interesting, if that's the case, that vision was somewhere between like 8 and 13 years before chapter 9. So so if that's if, if that's pointing back to that vision from chapter 8, Daniel's been waiting somewhere between eight and 13 years. And now Gabriel's finally coming to give him understanding. Um, which again is, um, has application for us today. You know, sometimes we, we have to wait for, for God's timing, eight, eight to 13 years for God to give us an answer to our prayer. You know, we get impatient, you know, I want to, I want an answer to my prayer right now, but it could be three weeks later. It could be eight to 13 years later. I don't know, anybody have any, any thoughts to share? And I think we shouldn't give up also. Like, you mm -hmm. know, if it's past a certain time, we think like, oh, that's it. It's never going to come true. Forget about it. And we just um, let it go. Yeah. Yeah, we seem to like give God a deadline. Okay, if you don't, you know, answer my prayer by next week, I'm I'm going to, I give up, you know. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, think of Daniel's prayer in, in chapter 10. It, that was only three weeks, but 
Yeah, what if Daniel had quit praying after one week or two weeks? Would, would God not have answered his prayer? I don't know. I mean, it's it's possible. Yeah, I don't know. There's still a lot of things about prayer that are kind of mysterious. But you know, Jesus told us in Luke 18, we're always to pray and not give up. So not lose heart. So that, now that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, if I keep praying diligently that God's going to answer it the way I want want him to answer, you know, we still need to be praying, you know, according to his will. Um, but you know, there's a lot of, I don't know, a lot of things there that are, that, at least to me, are still mysterious. I, or I wish I, wish I, well, no, I, I take that back. I was going to say, I wish I knew exactly how that worked, but I don't, because if I understood fully, then you know, God wouldn't be infinite. So um, I'll be satisfied to not know all the answers. Go ahead, Tom. What do you? What I mean, we just we know God has like divine wisdom, and He knows what how everything's going to eventually settle out. But I think about praying for my wife and my kids and stuff for all my life now it feels like, mm -hmm. and not getting that, and then Daniel almost gets interrupted, or God's like God's like sending them out like a nine one one call the angels, you know, while it, mm -hmm. while the call was still in the process. Yeah. It's just, uh, I, yeah, I don't I'm know if I'll ever this. understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess the lesson for us is, you know, just trust God that his, his ways are best. His timing is best. And I'm, I'm thankful that I don't always get prayers answered when I want them and what the way I want them because God's. But when they're best for us right? and they're best for his glory. Amen. Amen. Yeah. yeah, I think we look for that little, that little methodology, that little trick that we missed in the Bible. Oh, I forgot to say six of these. I should have said six mm -hmm. of these things, and right. that would have happened. You know, it's, it's just, he hears yeah. our hearts. Amen. He's got the right solution. Yeah, we we try to reduce it all to a formula. Follow these steps, and you know. Like like uh, watching a sporting event. Okay, well I had my lucky socks on when the you know when the Dodgers scored that run in the bottom of the ninth. So I got to make sure I wear my lucky socks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to try to put God in a box and reduce him to a formula. It's a, all about a, a relationship with him, and and that's that's a, should be a big part of our prayer. Shouldn't it? Our, our prayer is is just enjoying our relationship with the Lord. You know, just talking to Him and hearing from Him, not just. Not just making requests all the time. It's uh, you know, it's, it's just spending time with our heavenly Father. I mean, Jesus' response to the Father too was like, "Thy will be done." That's that's what we that's what we want. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's not something a little easier or something that'll make us happier inside or whatever. But it's mm -hmm. Thy will be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our prayers tend to be, okay, Lord, do whatever makes things easy and comfortable for me, right? Yeah, mine is my will be done. <laughs> yeah. All right. So anyway, I, I'm, I don't know if anybody else has insight in that. I don't know if Daniel, if Gabriel is telling him, it, it, it could be that he's giving him insight to that vision back on chapter eight that he didn't quite uh, understand. Or it could be he's referring just to chapter nine, but um, e either one I think would be appropriate because as we go through the next, what are we, nine, 10, 11, 12, next three or four chapters of, of Daniel, we're going to see that every one of these visions, every one of these visions and dreams, it, they're all very similar, It's but it's really all one prophecy. It's basically God telling Daniel and us Here's what's going to happen throughout history. There's going to be these world kingdoms that are going to just try to destroy my people. And but I'm going to use them to discipline you, to to turn your hearts back to me so that you repent and trust me. But in the meantime, you're going to go through a lot of trouble. There's going to be a lot of tribulation, even through the end. But then we're going to see in, in chapter nine, he says, But I'm going to send my Messiah. He's going to make atonement for your iniquity. It's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. He's going to make an end to sin. So, but then he said that uh, there's, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be wars. There's going to be desolation even to the end. 
but my my kingdom, I'm going to, just like he told him in the vision in chapter two and chapter seven, he's also going to tell him again in chapter 11 and 12, I'm going to bring in an everlasting kingdom. I'm going to destroy this final antichrist. I'm going to destroy all these world leaders. I'm going to set up my eternal everlasting kingdom. The, the saints are going to be, that kingdom is going to, you're going to rule and reign with me, This all the saints. There's going to, and then we'll get to chapter 12. He's going to talk about at the end, the, there's going to be a resurrection. Those The righteous are going to be raised to everlasting life. The, the unrighteous are going to be raised to everlasting contempt. So that's basically what this the prophecy is of Daniel. Is But each each vision, each dream gives a little bit more detail. So what was my point here? Um, oh, the, the, the reason Dan, Gabriel's coming to, to Daniel here in chapter 9 is to give him insight. He said, I'm going to give you insight, um, insight with understanding. I want to tell you how to, I want you to pay attention to this message, and I want you to gain understanding of the vision. And, you know, that, that, that the application for us is the same. You know, there's going to be these world, these world governments, these world powers, they're going to, and we see it, we see it today that your government's going to uh, try to force you into their mold, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you don't bow down, you're going into the fiery furnace. Daniel in chapter six, if you do bow down to your God, you're going into the lion's den. And that's, I think that's a, a picture of the, what Revelation talks about with the final Antichrist, the you know, the mark of the beast. Unless you take this mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. And, you know, essentially you're going to, we're going to cancel you. You're going to not be allowed to function if you don't. And taking the mark of the beast, and I'm getting a little bit off track, but I don't know that it's necessarily a physical mark because it says it's in your, either your right hand or on your forehead. If you look at uh, the scriptures, like in the Old Testament, you know, you're to tie up the word of God on your right hand and on your forehead, frontlets. I, I think it basically means, you know, is your allegiance going to be to Christ and the God of, of the Bible, or is your allegiance going to be to Satan and his his false religion? I think that's basically the the, the essence of it. If you're if you're and if that's the case, you know, you, there's going to come a time when we can't even buy or sell they're gonna try to if you if you're a business owner they're gonna try to destroy you um make it impossible for you to 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 live on this earth but uh anyway well yes yeah, so i got on that because of uh shadrach meshach and Abednego and, and daniel and the lion's dead i think that's i think that's a picture of what's coming at the end the, the world leaders are going to try to force us to bow down to their their false false gods did you happen to see or hear the colson five minute thing that they do like every night at six o'clock last night mm -hmm. they had a report from china where china wrote a thing about how they were gonna how i mean they're talking about they're talking about taking over the world they are talking about it and the guy mm -hmm. said something about and we are going to make christianity a grand thing under the government you know, like mm -hmm. we're going to show how grand a thing Christianity can be if hmm. run by the government. Wow. And I thought this man, what an evil thing that sent an evil shiver through my spine. Wow. Hmm. So China made that statement. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Tom, can you repeat that about Christianity? What did, what, what did they say? They, they, they uh, like a lot of people, they, they probably hear a lot of pressure about religious freedom in general. And, and so they, re, they responded and they said, well, we're going to, we're going to make Christianity, uh, uh, we're going to make people see uh, how grand Christianity can be when the government runs it. So the government's going to improve on it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And they just got that actually totally reversed. You know, yeah, the right. country might be better if it's under God, but Christianity is not going to be any good under yeah. the government. Yeah, right. So instead of having the country under God, they want God under the country. Just, yeah, just they're making wow. slaves. Out. Wow. Interesting. 
Well, I mean, that seems like it's playing right into Daniel. Yeah. So, yep. So now all I need to do hmm. is update could, could be in our generation. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Tom, are you copying and pasting? All right. So anyway, yeah, Gabriel came to Daniel because God cares about him. He's greatly beloved. He's highly esteemed. And that, that's why God comes to us as well. He responds to our prayers because we're greatly beloved. He cares about us. Uh, so now he's going to tell him the meaning of the, of the vision. In, in, three, in three minutes, we're going to cover the, this, the uh, most difficult passage of all in all of scripture. The uh, <laughs> there's a uh, yeah a little little uh, warning there I guess the, the, the these next four verses are considered by by many to be the most difficult and and highly debated passage of the Old Testament maybe of all all of Scripture um, this these seventy weeks in the Messiah so we've been how long we've we been studying Daniel now. We're, uh, he made a joke at the beginning, you know, how long this study was going to take. And I think he said, it's going to take 70 weeks, but I'll bet we, I bet we take longer than 70 weeks to get through Daniel. But uh, anyway, Gabriel's going to give Daniel uh, instruction here. He's going to give him understanding of this vision. And he talks about 70 weeks and the 70 weeks it's, it's actually 70 sets of seven that that word translated as weak and i should have written down what that word is forget what what the hebrew word is but it just means a set of sevens it can be a set of seven days seven months seven years in this case it's pretty clear that it's a set of seven years it's kind of like the word dozen you know if, if you say I want a dozen, or if I want 10 dozen, you know, it's 10 dozen what? You know, it could be 10 dozen eggs, it could be 10 dozen donuts, 10 dozen anything. So it's that's what these 70 weeks, these 77s, it could be 77s of anything, but the context and the in history proves out that it's that it's 70 years, uh seven, 70 sets of seven years. And to give you a uh I don't know if you want to say proof, but give you a, a reference where that was the case. If you look at, let's go to Genesis chapter 29. Do you remember Jacob and Laban and uh, what was his wife? Um, not Leah. Um, Jacob, Rachel. Was it Rachel? Yeah, Rachel and Leah. Genesis 29. Do you remember the story there with, with Jacob and his uncle Laban, how he was tricked? Jacob wanted to marry Rachel and Laban tricked him and gave him Leah instead because I think she was the older daughter. Is that correct? And so he said, I, I, you know, I didn't agree to this. I wanted, I wanted Rachel. And he said, well, I said, you can have her, but you have to serve me for seven years. You remember that? So look at Genesis 29 verses 27 to 30. So do you recall that Jacob worked for his uncle Laban for seven years, and then he ended up tricking him that he had to work another seven years. Um, but look how Genesis 29 words it. Genesis 29, verses 27 through 30. Verse 26, Laban said, it's not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. So he said, I can't give you Rachel until Leah is married off. So you have to marry Leah first. Look at what verse 27 says. I don't know what your translation says, but mine says, complete the week for this one, and we will give you the other also for the service which you shall serve with me for another seven years. So he's saying complete the week. And that week is a period of seven years. So there's there's one just one example where a week is not a week of days, but it's a week of years. So does that does that make sense? Is that helpful at all? So, so is that how um the, the Hebrews spoke back in the day? Like was that part of their vocabulary? 
You mean like a week? You mean seven years? Yeah, right. Uh, apparently, although well, I don't know what the, the exact, you know, I don't know Hebrew, but, you know, the way it's translated to English, it's, it says, you know, complete the week. It would be, um, I wish I had written down what that word is, but he would say complete the, I don't know what that word is, not Shabbat. Let me look it up real quick. Um, okay, I, now I need to know how to read Hebrew. Uh, you don't know? <laughs> it's, it means seven. I'd look up Strong's. There it is. Uh, it's Strong's reference number 7620, and it is... Well, show me what it looks like in English. It, What's the word you're looking for? Week or seven. Uh, um, like the Feast of Weeks. Um, count seven weeks. Huh. All right, let me look up strong accordance. Because, I mean, the message translation, for example, the way it says it, it's a little different. It says we don't do it that way in our country, said Laban. We don't marry off the younger daughter before the older. Mm -hmm. Enjoy your week of honeymoon, and then we'll give you the other one also. But mm -hmm. it will cost you another seven years of work. Yeah, I, I disagree with the way they translated that. Yeah, I think he means complete your week of service, your seven years service um let's see yeah okay if you look at the amplified it says finish the week for leah then we'll give you rachel and you'll work for me yet another seven more years so okay send so look at verse 28 so jacob complied and fulfilled leah's week then Laban gave him Rachel, his daughter, as his wife. So verse 28, he, he completed her week and gave him his daughter, Rachel. But anyway, yeah, I don't want to get too hung up on that. But um, there's other examples where a week is referring to seven years rather than seven days. I think, yeah, only if we know the original language, like, you know, we'll be able to fully understand what they were trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Because people would even argue with that with uh, Genesis, with the creation story. Right. You know, oh, that wasn't really a day and a week. It was. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> uh, Shabua, that's it. Shabua. I should have remembered that. I was, I was close. I. Yeah, so it's Shabuah. It can mean, let's see, here's what it can mean. It's period of seven. It's a, it's a heptad, like we would say a dozen or a decade. It's a heptad. It's a period of seven. It could be seven days in a week. It could be seven years. A heptad is seven years. So it could be, it could be either. But in this case, in Daniel 9, when we, when we look into it a little further, Further, we're going to see it's going to be pretty clear that he's speaking about years rather than days. So it's it's 70, 70 sets of seven years. So it's it's going to be 70 times seven years. And again, that's here comes that 70 times seven, which is which is going to be important to know. Remember, that's why they were in captivity for for seven for 70 years, because they failed to give the land its Sabbath rest for 70 times seven years. Now he's saying there's gonna I'm gonna give you another 70 times seven years to repent and come and trust in me. But we're running out of time, so we'll have to that'll be your teaser to keep you bring you back next week. So it's he's, he's, in seven days, we'll come back. Yeah, we'll come back in seven days. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, I can always count on you, Tom. Uh, <laughs> so well, anyways, what's what's our big lesson for that we can take away from this? I, there's a couple I think related to prayer. 
Yeah. Not give up. Not give keep up. Keep praying without ceasing. Yeah, keep praying without ceasing. Ceasing. Yeah, without ceasing. That's it. <laughs> yeah, pray without ceasing. Let listen to God when we're praying. Don't be so caught up in. And I think you gave a good illustration there, Sandra, with, with your prayer. Yeah. Trust God. He's He knows better than we do. Trust Him for His timing. Yeah. All righty. Well, would somebody like to close in prayer? Sure, I will. Thanks, Andrew. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you um, for bringing us together today and that we could unite in um, one spirit and um, study your word and um, edify one another. Thank you for sensitivity to your Holy Spirit, Lord. Um, and your word is so deep and has so much um, that we can always learn more and more. And um, it's so rich, Lord. And we just hunger and thirst for more. Um, and um, we pray that you will enlighten the eyes of our understanding in the knowledge of you. Help our love for you to grow stronger and stronger. And also our love for others around us. Help us to see others through your eyes, Father. Um, we pray um, that everything that um, we talked about today um, will take deep root in us and bear fruit. Um, we lift up our hearts into your hands. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be soft and tender always before you. And um, Holy Spirit, help us if we're um, getting calloused or hardened. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will alert us so um, we can draw near to you because you are the one who can always help us um, to be tender before you, Lord. And that's what we want to be. We want to have teachable spirits all the time. And um, we know you always have more to give us. Um, you're so good, Father. And so the more we taste you, we want more. And um, so we thank you, Father, for Jim and um, um, and uh, him helping us to learn in all of this. And uh, we pray our abundant blessing upon him, his family. We pray for Tom and Mark and Heen. Um, and um, we lift up each one of our needs into your hands, Lord. And uh, Father, you are such a good father to us. You take such good care of us. And we just come in our week into your hands, our families into your hands, and we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm. Thank Amen. you. All right. Well, y'all have a blessed week, a blessed set of sevens. And uh, well, <laughs> thanks, Jim. See, see you back next week, Lord willing. Yep. yep. Thank Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.